Hey everybody, it is Richard Harris and Scott Lease. We are here, I think we're on episode nine um, of the Surf and Sales podcast. We're super excited about this. Uh, we have with us today, uh, Carolyn Betts Fleming from Betts Recruiting. Um, obviously started when, uh, you know, under her maiden name before she met her <laughs> current, before she met her husband. And we're really excited. Scott and I've known Carolyn for several years now. I remember meeting Carolyn when I was long before I was ever a, a consultant and just sort of getting to know her and always found her insight and her energy super infectious. So Carolyn, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's uh, fun to be here with you guys. Yeah, we, yeah, good to see you again, Carolyn. And you know what, I really want to thank you, by the way. You guys did an amazing job on that training uh, in Texas. And thank you for um, dropping your knowledge on our, our team members. The, the feedback was phenomenal. So thank oh. you so much for that. Oh, thanks for that. It was, it was awesome to be able to use the office there. Yeah, we didn't even, we didn't ask Carolyn to say that. So thank you. Carolyn. <laughs> we appreciate it. This is not a plug in yeah. day uh, no. podcast. But, um, so Carolyn, I, I think a, a fun place to start often is sort of the origin, right? Like going way back before you created Betts Recruiting, like what was your last job before Betts? And then what made you go, wait a minute, I can do this better. Yeah, well, I'll go real fast a little bit before that because it, it'll show how old I really am. Uh, my first job out of college was selling yellow page ads in the book, like when they had the actual book. So that was a yeah. hardcore hustle sales job, learned a ton. Uh, and from there, I fell into recruitment and I worked at another boutique for about four years. And then I took my media-ish experience and recruiting and I went to careerbuilder.com and I did enterprise sales there for a couple years and great company awesome you know much larger company than I've been with in the past uh, had an opportunity to sell you know into large organizations complex sales cycle multiple decision makers and um, but at the end of the day I just really missed recruiting and um, building those solid relationships on both the talent side and with the companies so when I did some soul searching uh, about 10 actually this is kind of funny uh, 10 years ago on January 1st was my first full-time day uh, running bets recruiting so wow. it's been a really fun long uh, interesting ride and yeah so what was yeah I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask do you remember what day one was like January what? 1st, like what were you, were you like building a logo? Were you deciding on a name? Were you like, oh my God, what am I doing? Like what was day, do you remember? Well, I think anyone that starts their own company, you know, when you're working for a larger organization, you tend to get your ducks in a row a little bit before, you know, go time, full time. So right. I had the logo, I had the website, I had all that stuff, but I made a huge mistake. And because um, my boss knew, you know, that that was my last day, I'd given my notice long before. Uh, and, but I decided that day on New Year's to like, uh, but you used to be able to take all your contacts from LinkedIn and like send a mass message. So I did that. And, but he hadn't told all the people at career builder yet that I was leaving. Uh, and so <laughs> all, all these executives and like literally everyone I was connected to on LinkedIn gets this message about uh, me starting best recruiting. And uh, anyway, I got my hand slapped there, but was really no longer in it. Was your la what were they going to do? You, you were leaving. Like, you know. <laughs> I, know. I know, but you don't want to burn any bridges, right? And I just, you know, you don't this, know what you don't know. <laughs> this actually is a great segue, right? Because Scott and I talk about this a lot. And I think we even talked about it at the at, in Austin is, who owns your LinkedIn, right? That's Carolyn's LinkedIn. Those are your contacts. They're not your company, right? Yeah. How do you, what do you got? Just out of curiosity, as we, as we talk to, to, you know, whether you're on the recruitment side, a, a hiring manager, or you're a rep, or you're a manager looking for a new gig, how do you guys coach people on leveraging LinkedIn in that job moment? And it could be, there's a couple of answers. It could be that, hey, before you start the actual thing, go update LinkedIn this way, make sure these notifications, whatever. Like, how do you guys coach people on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and, and one of the things that, you know, the topics that you guys have brought up, like, is the resume dead? And I, and I don't think it is. But the first thing that people look at when they're considering you as a candidate is generally LinkedIn, right? They look at your 
picture and how you present your experience, you know, try and, and they write their own story about what it is that your background looks like, right? They generally see, okay, you know, did you go to college? If so, where, when did you graduate? And then, you know, what information can I deduce from that? What was your first job? How long did you stay there? Where did you, you know, and, and they really write their own story of what your career path was. And so I think the more information you can have on there, uh, the better. And, you know, and there's also this debate that goes on in, in the world out there of, as a salesperson, do you put your sales performance on your LinkedIn? <laughs> and, and what do you, how do you advise people? Do you tell them to do that? Yes or no? You know, I think you want to be pretty, um, no, because you, when you're in sales, your customers are looking at this too, right? And yeah, you know, I see these things where it's like, I crush sales, blah, blah, blah. And that's, a, you know, not the consultative sales uh, person that a lot of customers are looking to do business with. So, so my there's, recommendation there's prob- is there's like- a tactful way, right? Exactly. So I think tactfully putting your sales performance on there, top performer, president's club. I don't think we need a quarter by quarter, play by play. You yeah. can save that for your resume uh, or for, you know, other recruitment oriented platforms where you can, you know, really that it's not customer facing because LinkedIn is everything to everybody, right? You have your customers, you have your pro- prospects, you have your clients, you have your employer and you have, um, you know, potential employers out there and, you know, probably many other categories. So you want to make it uh, appealing to everybody <laughs> in all those different in all those different senses. So, so let me let me challenge you then, because I am somebody who believes that the resume is dead. Okay. I have I do not remember the last time I gave somebody a resume, and the last time somebody asked me for a resume, I said, "Yeah, go to my LinkedIn profile and download the PDF if you want my resume." So, what? What advantages does a resume hold that I'm not thinking about any, anymore? You're saying LinkedIn is everything, but the resume is not dead. So what's the use case for a, a resume? Okay, and just, just so to set the tone here, like obviously you are far further along in your career as a VP of sales, now running your you know, own business, uh, your, your reputation. Fair enough. Okay, so... But when you're an individual contributing salesperson or even a mid-level manager, uh, it's really used for on the interview. When you walk in and, be, and it shows that you're prepared, it shows that you've thought it out, it has all your stats, all the data, all the information, the logos, a lot of stuff that you can't include on LinkedIn or that your employer yeah. might not want you to, or that you want to be a little bit more, you know, presenting yourself to all the different use cases of how you present yourself on LinkedIn. So the resume, um, having a printed resume shows all yeah. that great stuff. So it's, it's, so you could say then it's, it's more for the in-person part of the process. hundred percent. And not. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I agree. I agree with that. I agree with that. <laughs> I, I personally, as I've interviewed people um, over the last few years, don't really have an expectation that, that people come in. But I will say that the people who come in and have one and kind of say, hey, here's my resume if you want it. I like that gesture. Even if I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. I just reviewed your LinkedIn profile for five minutes. Like, it's all good. I like the gesture, though. So I, I, I can get behind that. <laughs> cool. I, I'm, I'm a, I, I'll you know, push it a little differently, too, is that I do think you should have quarter by quarter performance. I do think you should have on your LinkedIn profile 102% Q3 2019. 101% Q2 2019. Um, okay, but that, but Richard, that's even, that's more tactful than being like, you know, my right, sales number right, was 304,000 right. and I closed these particular accounts, which I've seen on people's LinkedIn profiles before. I, I, still, I, st- I do tell people to name, if you're particularly if you're going after enterprise, right? If you are going after enterprise, I, you know, I, I believe you can put in tactfully, as you said, you know, here are, the, here are the numbers for the quarter, uh, clients included. And I want them to be able to come to me and go, because to Carolyn's point, they write their own story. So I need to control that narrative a little bit more by saying, oh, I closed this client, this client, this client, right? Not all of them. Would, but I got a would, you, would, you, would you try to control that narrative like while you're at your current role? I, I could see it like, <laughs> okay, I've decided to move on. Now I'm going to add, you know, Nike and AMX and like, you know, massive companies. Ask Carolyn. So like, wh- while you're there, so, so, solve the debate for us, Carolyn. Yeah. You know, I think 
And as a recruiter, like if somebody has all that on their LinkedIn, you're like, okay, this person's solid, right? And you're definitely going to reach out to them. But if they're an enterprise salesperson, XYZ company, that's a fit for your client, you're going to reach out to them regardless, right? And so it, it's just, it's up to personal preference of how much information you want to share, right? Like, um, I, I I used to, right? You know, as somebody who's the top performer, like you want to, and I have logos back from my career builder days on my LinkedIn. Uh, so personally, I, but other people want to keep it a little bit more private or, and, and that's fine too. I, I think you look like a stronger candidate if you have that stuff on there. Wow. So, so, <laughs> Alan, what are, what, so let's say, so we talked a little bit about your know, LinkedIn and the resume, right? And I, and I do like Scott's point of like, hey, it's a gesture right? It, it's showing a certain level of respect for that person. Um, what are the mistakes you see people doing or having, not on their resume or anything, but maybe just going into a first interview? What do you, you know, what, what, are, what are mistakes we see people make and we can give them advice? Don't do this anymore. <laughs> I, there's a lot, but I think. Well, how about, how about more specifically mistakes top people make? Not junior level people and basic dumb errors, but what about mistakes that people, you know, shouldn't be making that are that are quite good, right? Well, and because they're good, they might not need the new job. They might be treating it more as like a informational situation, and they're just too casual. They don't prepare. They haven't done the research. They might not have even. And and it happens all. And it, you know, it's interesting because as part of our process at Bets uh, with our services clients, like we, our clients expect that we make sure that people are prepared. And that's also another debate of like how well, how much do we prepare them versus not prepare them. And constantly, I hear you know, things happen and these experienced enterprise salespeople go in for interviews and they just blow it. And, you know, we're always like, well, you know, did you, were they prepared? Like, did you make sure? And they're like, well, they're so senior. I just assumed that they would know all this stuff. And, um, and sometimes they just don't, or they, they do know it, but they just cut corners because they think there's, you know, they understand that their experience is valued on the market and that they can kind of approach it in a little bit less of a professional way than they would a sales call or anything else in business. Hmm. Let, let me change the topic on you a little bit. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about the differences in managing a pipeline as individual contributor at Yellow Pages and, and career builder versus managing the pipeline, you know, when you were first building your business and managing the pipeline now in, in, in recruiting versus like, account selling or maybe it's the same same thing to you i'm curious about that kind of the differences there and the evolution of that so okay so it's interesting right because we basically have a marketplace business and so you know we have our services and then we have the platform that i, I told you guys about but so it's really interesting because there's two sides to it where um you know at career builder once the client, you know, once whatever company was I was selling into decided that they wanted to purchase Career Builder, that was it. We signed the agreement and then it moved on to a CSM. In recruiting, it's a lot longer of a process, right? Because first you have to identify the company. They either come to us or we figure out that they're doing a lot of hiring and would be a good fit within the market that we work in. And then, like, once they sign, that's when the real work begins because then we have to go hunt and pitch all the candidates. It's Etc. So, uh, you know, we have a pretty complex way that we track things. And we actually at Vets have different people that bring on the companies and then different people that find the candidates and manage the relationships after the fact, uh, because it is kind of a different sale. So, but for us, like, so that the BD part of the sales is tracked pretty basically. And, and there's no, well, you know, there's an engagement fee, but the real, um, economics are more on the back end of once we get the talent on on board um, and then you know with the platform it's very much like the career builder model where you pay for access and that sales model um, now on the back end we do have the CSM model uh, to make sure that you know the clients happy and in interviewing etc so I, I, it's a lot of different moving parts and it's a lot more complex than a typical SaaS sale and what about at the beginning the beginning as you were growing the business, right? So I'm going to assume, you know, you're on your, on your own January 1st, you know, 10 years ago, you're, you're hustling to get all these accounts and then you're, you know, trying to f fulfill these accounts. What are some of the ways that you manage to 
manage that pipeline and we're able to keep growing and keep, you know, keep building your pipeline and, and growing and expanding your, your business. You know, I ask this as somebody who's, you know, re, re-emerging as an individual contributor, right? Because I've, I've gone into business for myself now three months ago and I'm like, oh yeah, I have to keep building my own pipeline now. I don't have a whole team, you know, doing it for me. So I'm selfishly asking this question, I guess, for everybody else out there who has the same, uh, same kind of challenge. How did, how did you, how did you do that? Yeah. Um, so that, that, that's the reason why Bet's recruiting is not a one person shop anymore, right? We have well over a hundred people <laughs> between our five offices because it's a lot of work. And so you always have to find in recruiting the customers first, right? Who's hiring, get them to sign, get them, but you want to have enough customers as well that, you know, especially back then we were just contingency. And so, you know, if, if somebody changed their mind or, you know, hiring plans change or they went internal, whatever it was, you want to make sure that you can send these candidates multiple places. So it is like a, it's running a marketplace business where the pendulum always swings and it's never a perfect match, right? You either have too much, too many clients that really want all the candidates and clients always want more and more candidates or, um, you know, not enough companies. And then, you know, you have a lot of candidates that are really strong and you want to make sure that you find the companies. So, but in the early, early days, it's all about getting the, the logos, the companies on board. Because when you have good clients and cool companies that are doing awesome things with great leaders, then the, the rest falls into place. Scott, take notes on that. You know what you need to do now? Can you translate that? <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re-listen to this episode like 50 times. Exactly. And I, I, I haven't mentioned this earlier. I'm going to be in Austin next week. If you want to get lunch or something, we can go deeper on, on some Done. stuff. <laughs> Done. Done. What are, what are some of the myths um, about recruiters that need to be dispelled, right? So I'm a huge fan of recruiters. Like Scott and I are both like, oh, if you're ever looking for a new job, like absolutely go get a recruiter. Let them do a lot of heavy lifting for you, right? They'll give you some coaching. They'll give you some feedback. They'll tell you what to update on your resume, your LinkedIn profile. They'll teach you about who the company is like but what are some of the myths that y'all run into or or the you know that we could help dispel for people who may be thinking about recruiters okay and are we talking about on the company side or on the talent side why not we do both okay sure. um well, I, I think the company side, it, it's, and it depends on the size of the company. Um, most hiring people, like, you know, VPs of sales, sales managers, et cetera, love using recruiters, right? They, because, and especially in sales, because they understand that the economics are aligned well to have somebody go execute for them. Also, you know, the specialization. However, as companies get bigger and, and they bring in in-house recruiters, there's sometimes a conflict between internal and external recruiters who does what. Um, and, and, and so the myth there is, um, I, I think that things just have to be set up a lot more cleanly in the beginning of, of who runs in what lane and what we're doing, what you're doing, et cetera. So there's not conflict there. And I, I'm, I'm trying to think if there's any real myth, but um, as these companies get like, and I, I do think there's a myth that goes around that um, I hear from sales leaders that, you know, internal recruiters aren't as good as agency recruiters. And, and it's, internal recruiters are, are awesome and they, and they definitely serve a place in an organization. What I see happen very frequently is it's like this, you know, injection. Oh, hey, we hired an internal recruiter. All of our dreams are, you know, coming true. This person's going to get all these hires. We're going to save so much money on all these different things. And that, and those people just aren't really set up for success uh, in the, in what it is that they're looking to accomplish, right? They'll have like a hundred open recs and two people and it just doesn't really work that way there's a lot of work that goes into it on the back end yeah the challenge i see on the internal recruiter is that they're often then inundated from marketing engineering and sales and they can help manage a process but they can't become experts at what's a good engineer what's a good salesperson right until they've done it enough times right um you know unbeknownst you know people are probably going oh richard and scott probably hired carolyn once at some point well i'll be honest with you i know scott scott doesn't scott has never used a recruiter but that's because Scott's got a degree in psych. He's got a degree in psychology and how human and human learning. I don't think that's the reason why. <laughs> so, but, I, but I know Car I know Carolyn's been like trying to get Scott to use him, and he's been in organizations big enough. But 
you know. Yeah, actually, Scott, after you left Qualia, they signed us. <laughs> We've been doing so much business with them lately. Yeah, that, is, that is that is Carolyn's version of "fuck you" to Scott. No. Right <laughs> well, no, well done. No, well like, done. There's, you, <laughs> but, like, there's certain levels of ability to execute on sales hiring, and Scott, like you're the top one percent of leaders out there that really understood of building an employment brand for yourself. What what coming to work for me is. Um, you know, getting the referral, like you did a really, really great job. And it's just, some people are better at it than others. And, um, and other people focus their energy elsewhere, right? They, they might, and, and your, yours is really big on team. Other people are more external with helping with deals or whatever. But I think in the SMB type sales environment, uh, what you were, you know, with the transactional type of model, um, it's all about building the right team and people that are willing to grind for you. I just got our headline to get people to download this. Hear how Carolyn Scott F you. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> she she pays me back after a decade of right. avoidance. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So, <laughs> what about I I have a, a a myth. Maybe it's a maybe it's a myth. I'm curious what you think. Um and hopefully it's not too controversial a statement, but it seems to me that you know, it's, it's definitely not, um, it's definitely true that there is a gap between women and sales, women and men in sales, right? That gap seems to disappear almost on the recruiting side. It, it feels like there are significantly more women in sales on the recruiting side of things. Do you agree? Is, is that an accurate? Yeah. I mean, on, on my part? And especially, right, when you look at our company, um, and, and I'm, I've been working really hard to try and have a more 50-50 or at least 60-40 organization because right now we're 80% women and 20% men. And what I think happens is it's really, you know, most motivated women want to work for other women, right? You see people, women in leadership, women moving up in their careers, women making lots of money, yeah. and that's attractive, right? And it's like, okay, well, if they have all these other women that are really successful, then I have a good chance of being successful. So I attribute it to that, right? As a female founder, yeah. it's going to be an attractive opportunity for other women. And so I think when, you know, you look at building for everyone, you know, we want more women. Like we have some clients that, that say, oh, you know, only send us female candidates because we're really looking to, you know, balance our team. We have too many men right now. And, you know, so you have to really be, and a lot of these earlier stage companies have a massive advantage of building a diverse team because they don't already have a team, right? Once your team's not diverse, it's harder because, you know, everyone looks at what it is and, and isn't sure if they're going to feel included or welcome so you, i guess it's a long answer to a simple question but it, it's is, a hot topic right now for what sure. do you what do you think what attracts women and I'll, I'll go a step further and tell me if i'm wrong is that i often see more females and female leadership in the hr role in general as well as in the recruiting role and is it is it just because that's how it's been for so long kind of almost almost like well teachers often are predominantly women, so women gravitate to that because there's one, like, is it, and I hate to be, I don't, I, I'm not trying to, to, you know, overly, I don't want to be inappropriate around it, but it's, it's, that's how I see it. And maybe I'm just blind because I am a guy. I don't know. Like, <laughs> it's a hot topic for sure. And you know, I think it comes down to, you know, nature versus nurture. What types of jobs do women uh, really enjoy, right? And I think also how you were raised. And, you know, some people were, you know, I still remember when I was in high school, I wanted to take Spanish. I'm from California. I grew up in the Bay Area. And my mom said, no, you know, boys take Spanish, girls take French, you know, <laughs> It's like, are you kidding me? Uh -huh. This is like something real that happened. And, you know, obviously my parents are lovely people and it was not no way, you know, meant to be like that. But right. I just, I, I think it has to do with, you know, and, and I think now, um, you know, I love uh, John Barrows' book about, um, you know, I want to be in sales when I grow up, right? And it's a, his daughter. Um, and I, I think that, fathers, mothers, et cetera, are empowering women to be in the workforce, right? Like before it's like, 
you know, a lot of women didn't even work, right? And so I think that, and then if you did, maybe you were a teacher or whatever. So I, I think it's really just education at younger ages, right? Even starting in high school and before of what various career opportunities look like and what is exciting for people. I, 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 and I think that you hit the nail on the head when you said that, um, you know, a lot of women, when they look for mentors and, and like whose path they want to follow, they look towards other women. And women, I had a friend who told me, you want to get more women into sales, you need more women in sales leadership positions. Because successful women in sales leadership positions will attract other women into the field, and they will then mentor them and develop the next generation of, uh, of female sales leaders, right? So I, I, think, I think that's a, that's a huge, huge, huge part of it. I, another thing that, 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 I, that I see is, you know, I, I'm not sure that women at least on LinkedIn have historically been as comfortable sort of self-promoting. I think, I think a lot of men and in particular men in sales who are, you know, often quite vocal and confident and whatnot, like you have no problem getting online and, you know, bragging about their accomplishments and espousing advice all over the place. And, you know, it seems like that trend is changing a little bit now, finally, but I think over the last five years or so, I think women have been a little slower to, you know, really try to brand themselves as an expert and declare themselves an expert. So ho hopefully that stuff, you know, changes is one of the reasons that we wanted to get, you know, you on the show as somebody who's <laughs> been in sales, been super successful at sales, built your own business, been super successful at building your own business, right? Uh, so ho hopefully, you know, we, we can kind of keep pushing the envelope and get some change going. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with that, right? And um, yeah, I, it's funny because I, I, people say that to me all the time. You should put more on LinkedIn and, you know, <laughs> like, I know I should, but <laughs> I just, <laughs> it's not, I like, there's a lot happening at that show. Well, you just, you just you, I mean, you're, 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 you guys are so big now. You should just be like Gary V and you, you know, you should have a team of 40 who just puts content out for you all day long, Carolyn. Well, yeah, why isn't Coca doing it. Oh, no, Coca. Yeah, Co yeah, Coca should be doing all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what what advice do you have for people um and i've got a piece of advice but but i want to hear it from you is that you know you get that that inevitable that unfortunate call of, from your recruiter saying hey they decided to go in a different direction right because it happens a lot and uh, there's rejection in sales we all know it um what advice do you give to people to prepare to hear for it or when that happens, like, is there, is there some coaching you can give to them um, as they're working with the recruiter about how to handle this better or just as a human, how to handle it better? So our business is all about building long-term relationships, right? And the transactional mindset in this line of work just doesn't work right and, and i think that that is you know back to the point about the myths out there right the recruiters are just in it to like shove you into the job and you know that's all they care about and it's absolutely not true right we've worked with over ten thousand people to you know introduce them to job opportunities thousands of companies i think last i checked it was like close to three thousand companies and and that doesn't happen if you have a you know, a mindset of somebody takes another job in Europe. And, and obviously for me, it's a much higher level, bigger picture type thing. But for the recruiters as well, the relationships that you build at bets internally, externally, you know, with your talent that you're representing and with your clients are, you know, a foundation that you will build upon for the rest of your career. So having a transactional mindset. So, so, it, you know, it's kind of the bigger picture, right? And if you have a full pipeline and you're doing all the things that you know that you should do and you're working with lots of candidates and they're very strong people, losing that one deal isn't a big deal. But it's when you're like, you know, this Hail Mary situation falls through. It, it really is more of a lack of uh, building the right pipeline and having a good pool of talent that you're working with than this one off situation. What about what about the candidate? What advice can you give to the candidate who's getting that call? Carolyn's calling me to say, hey, Richard, you know. Oh, sorry. You okay. Love me. You know, uh, we have a good relationship. They decide to go in a different direction. Right. 
Yeah. Well, the good news is uh, we generally have lots of other opportunities that we can <laughs> them to. So there's always kind of the, but hey, you know, I know you said you weren't as excited about this other company we talked about, but, you know, I know Scott or Richard or whoever, you know, the hiring authority is, and I really think that you should meet that person, right? Yeah. So there's an easy way to, you know, push them forward and, you know, have additional opportunities. And, and if anything, it's an opportunity to have them, um, you know, and sometimes they just picked another candidate and it happens. These people are in sales as well. So I, I, I feel like they should, you know, things, if, if rejection isn't something that you can handle in sales, you should probably choose a different career path, you know, not to be flippant, but. Yeah. When you're, when you're, when you're talking, when you're talking, when you and your team are talking to candidates who are, interviewing for um, like their first role where they're trying to level up, like let's say somebody's first director role or first VP of sales role or first CRO role, what, what, kind of, what kind of advice do you give candidates that you, know, feel like you feel like is strong on paper and you believe in their candidacy, right? But you know, they're, they're maybe struggling to land a role. Maybe, you know, how, how, are you, how do you guys help them tell their story. I'm thinking about a couple people that I know who are in this exact position who can't quite seem to land that next level up role, even though I feel and they feel like they're ready for it. Well, and the easiest way to do that is internally, right? You've proven yourself. People see how hard you're working. You have, a, you know, you work with mentors or whatever it is. You, you already are doing the next level job. So when that job opens, you're the first person. Now, in some companies, they're not growing as fast anymore, or you know, there's other people ahead of you for those opportunities, and you might have to leave that company to find what's yeah. next. And I think I'm, I'm thinking about those kind of scenarios. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to make that point, right? Because I think a yeah. lot of people, or even if you want to, trans, you know, we have people that want to transition from, you know, sales into marketing. It's like, okay, none of my clients are going to hire you for that. Like my clients want me to find experienced marketing people. Right. But if you, at your current, can you, can you repeat that sentence again? Because I can't tell you how many salespeople are like, Oh, I really want to end up going to the marketing. And then they're like, Oh, I can't get a marketing job. Say that sentence again. I think she said, no, I, my clients are not going to hire you if you're in sales and you're looking for a marketing job. <laughs> It's true. They want people that have done the marketing job, right? And yeah. so the easiest way to do that, though, is internally, right? Like find somebody in marketing, but this is not the point of this. So, um, so my recommendation is, you know, mentors, right? Finding people from former companies that you've worked with that have ha made those moves, understanding how they made it happen, um, I, I can tell you most of the time there are, we do have some clients that, um, will hire AEs as SDR managers um, because the SDR manager world out there is you, everyone needs them and there's just not a lot of them out there and um, they don't really want to hop around. So there are some, that's one kind of way up that I see from sales into leadership. Um, and then the sales path, you know, doing the SDR to AE to enterprise is a little bit easier than, than the leadership jump. What do you, what, what kind of advice do you give? And I, I mean, I think we know it, but I'd love to just hear from your perspective. Maybe you are that young, you know, that, that person who just graduated, right? It's January. It could, someone may be listening to this in June. They just graduated um, and they want to get into sales and maybe they haven't had it. You know, maybe they didn't go work at, you know, I worked at the gap. I at least had some sales experience when I first started. Um, I worked at the gap too. Did you? Oh, did you? <laughs> we could, we okay, could. you too. I never had a retail job. <laughs> retail, retail is also known as consistent inbound sales. Um, but what kind of things can they talk about to promote themselves as, hey, I've got the right personality? Because sometimes it just comes down to personality that early in their career. Okay, so so your gap example is, is fine, but like, I remember, you know, like it, it's going above and beyond, right? Like it, it, the Gap, if you had the number one, we used, they just want to s sign up everyone for Gap credit cards when I worked there and you got a dollar per one. And so I was just like trying to get every single person to sign up for the credit card. So you want to tell that story, right? Or um, 
you know, what other things that you've sold? And, and uh, TK, who uh, was the founder of CowDap, sold the Marketo, and a uh, great guy, he used to always ask, and I ask this a lot on our interviews and I train my team to, tell me about the first time you ever sold something. And it doesn't have to be as an SDR or whatever, right? It can be, you know, magazines or can, whatever it is. But the more creative and the more you can talk about how you did it better than everybody, worked harder, all of those things, that'll really give you a leg up. Uh, I, and one, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I've always taught people to say, talk about the first time you sold your parents on letting you go to Mexico for spring break in college, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's probably the biggest close. I would the, never get hired for, because I was never allowed to go on those trips. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did your parents know about you, Carolyn? Like, oh, they're, they're oh, they, all, they, all, all, all her mom knew is that she was going to French class. Right. You can't go to Mexico yeah. for spring break. You know French. We'll yeah. send you to Paris. I did go to Paris, though, so that was good. Yeah. <laughs> That's actually kind of better now that I think about it. But um, so, and then the other thing is like reading up on the industry, right? There's so many books and you know all the content that you guys are producing, and and there's a lot of people that are doing this of you know being a student of what you want to get into and being able to speak to that when you meet with people as well. Yep. What, tell, tell us a little bit more about what Betts has got going on. I know, I know you guys have made a big um, addition that's, you know, we, don't, we certainly don't want to turn this into a pitch, but I think it's super valuable for people to understand. You know, you've said a couple of times services, right? People probably hear services from recruiters all the time. And I, <laughs> I know, I know you guys have done some stuff that's different. So, Please feel free to share fo with folks what that means. Um, yeah, so it's really exciting. Uh, in so just not to get too, uh, but a lot of times as companies get bigger, and most of our clients do, they're well funded. They tend to move from using external partners like us to internal recruiters, and um, and then a lot of times they'll you know kind of on again off again relationship and and. But they always said, you guys should build a platform. So what we did over the last two plus years, so we, we just launched it in Q4, but this has been a project I've been working on for quite some time now, is that we developed a platform. So salespeople can go on, put up all their stats, everything they've done. Um, it, it's called Bets Connect. So if you Google it, it, it's pretty clear on the website of what exactly it is. And then these companies, so we're basically selling into larger companies that have, you know, fully baked internal recruiter teams that can then go in and access all of the active and passive talent pool that Bets is working with, which is, you know, we've worked with over 200,000 people in the course of, you know, bets. And uh, we have about 100,000 people in there with really rich data. And then they can go in and opt in to have these companies be able to access them with either active, passive, or we're just starting this new um, setting called Make Me Move, where you're really happy. But hey, if a better opportunity comes along, um, it's a little more passive than passive, I guess. <laughs> and uh, and that's, uh, that's it. So uh, companies now pay a subscription to access our, our rich talent pool and all the data. And they, you know, we do have a little bit of uh, account management, but definitely not as much as our, our, you know, hardcore services business. So are you, are you saying, and I want to make sure I understood it. So if I'm a, if I'm a rep, right. And I'm like, you know, Hey, I just hit my four year cliff January 1st and I need to start looking or whatever. They could go and actually just upload their profile. Yeah. Well, they have to talk to somebody on our team. So, That's so they, we, we build out, they, you know, in tandem, we build out their profile. Uh, we just, you know, make sure everything seems legit. And then it goes live once they opt in uh, to have their data be accessible. And it's only bets clients that can view it. So, um, so it's not like your current employer will be able to, to see that you're doing that, you know, and, 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 and it blocks from there. Got it. This is the beautiful part. I don't know if you heard that, but my garage door opened because I'm working in the garage as we're doing <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as we As we wind down the, the show here, um, Carolyn, we like to do something at the very end that's a little bit different. We like to kind of turn it around and say, how can we help you? Is there any questions or, or you know, things that you want to ask us or things that we might be able to do to, to uh, help you and your business and, and your team? 
Um, gosh, nothing's really coming. You guys have just been so awesome. Like it was super, I, I love the fact that you guys reached out to do the training in our Austin office. We're always happy to, to have anybody like you guys use any of our offices to do that type of stuff. And, and thank you for including my team. That meant a lot to me. And obvious, you know, the obvious thing is that, you know, people are wanting to see what's next. Or if you hear about them wanting to build their go-to-market teams, please, uh, please send them our way. And um, yeah, we'll do. Yeah. And how about you guys? What what else can I do to help you? I think this is good. I'd I'd love to. Uh, I haven't even run this by Scott, but I'd love to talk to a couple of your um, people on your recruiting team. Like, let them understand what it's like to be a sales rep at a recruiting office because I think it's very different than a traditional SaaS sale, right? Like, they've got two customers, they've got the candidate, they've got the company. Um, you know, I think it'd be fun to talk to some of them. Obviously, I, I think there's another value to that is, as you know, maybe even we bring in two people, right? Bring in two people and interview both of them, um, just as something different on our podcast. So if you'd be open to that, I think that'd be kind of fun. Absolutely, yeah, yeah they would love yeah. that. And just as, as, go ahead. As for me, Carolyn, I'm just waiting for my referral check for the quality of deal that you. <laughs> I was wondering when that was coming. Since, since, you know, I, since I built them to such a size and scale and the amount of funding that they got to that they could afford you, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's what you could do for me. <laughs> awesome. Carolyn, uh, how can people get in touch with you? Get just that, Carolyn at vetsrecruiting.com uh, is my email. That, that's probably the easiest way. Right? And LinkedIn. Yeah, of course. We're always there, right? <laughs> So, Carolyn, thank you thank so much for coming on. We really, really appreciate it. Uh, it's been super fun and valuable and, and appreciate all the insights. It's been really great. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Sure. I always enjoy talking to you. And, I'm, and if you're in Austin next week, I'm going to reach out to you. Yeah, I'll shoot you a text. All right. Thanks, Carolyn. <laughs>